and we are live again. Welcome back to uh, EDEC Infra Live and to our debate, our research debate, uh, entitled Towards Modern Infrastructure Investment Methods and Products. And I added a question mark at the end of that because the future is uncertain. And as you now know, when that's the case, you need to add a little risk premium. Um, and because this industry may or may not evolve in the future, it may not change, but there's potential for a lot of change. Uh, I like to say that it may decide to either stay in the darkness with real estate or step towards the light and become more like the hedge fund sector, for example, follow a completely different path. Anyway, we'll see. Uh, what I do believe is that with better data and analytics, uh, a number of players will develop a significant comparative advantage and change this industry. So. Uh, this is an applied research debate, so I've invest, invited several practitioners to join me to debate, and, and we'll see if they, they agree with me. Um, so I have five eminent heads, heads off, I should say, um, around me. First, Laurence Meunier, Head of Strategy and Research Alternative Income Solutions at Aviva. Hello. Gianluca Minella, Head of Infrastructure Research at DWS. Amaric Ubi, Global Head of infrastructure investment uh, at, in the Mercer Private Market Group. Um, Michael Sukanitsky, Head of Private Market Risk at USS Investment Management. And finally, Avi Turetsky. Are you the head of something? You got it. I guess you could say I'm the head of original research at- uh, All right. Partner at the RS Secondary Solutions Quantitative Research Group and head of original research uh, at Landmark. Uh, Comma Landmark. and Areas Company. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but I take this opportunity to thank you for also for supporting us today uh, in, this, in this endeavor. Um, so it's a team effort, right? We're gonna be uh, discussing the, a, a number of topics. This is not a panel. We're not pitching whatever it is our companies are selling. Um, whatever we say probably only represents our personal views, I, uh, at, least, at, at least represents that. And um, I'm not going to tell you about everybody's CV, so I made a collective CV. I thought that'd be quicker, right? So collectively, we hold multiple PhDs. We have at least six or seven master's degrees from some of the most prestigious universities in the UK, in Europe, and in the US. We've also collectively worked for a range of asset owners, asset managers, banks, rating agencies, often in a research capacity, both on equity and debt, to these institutions that we all represent, collectively manage several hundred billions of assets uh, in infrastructure. Uh, so together, hopefully, we should have something to say about the future of infrastructure investing and the relationship with, with data, because that's what we're interested in today. So at the end of this session, I will put forward five predictions um, to you, and I will ask you by a show of hands to vote for uh, whether you think they're credible or not. Um, and that might be one way to achieve some kind of Debate. consensus. Uh, feel free to throw in other predictions when that time comes, because there's five of you. I know there won't be any tie. So uh, this is, uh, is going to be interesting. OK, so let's get started. Um, first, we have our first topic. Um, the role of data and infrastructure investment today. We have to start somewhere, so we start today. So infrastructure investment, as we uh, like to put it, always starts with a narrative. We wrote that paper a long time ago, describing this narrative, this great arc. Um, a story, investment beliefs, I think people say in some quarters. Um, so it's a bunch of ex-ante ideas one has about infrastructure. In fact, if you think about it, it's about what infrastructure is like on average almost by definition. Um, and even though the average might be true, what's interesting in the investment world is that there's variance around this average. You don't necessarily get the average. In fact, you may not even be able to buy the average. So that's why we're interested in risk, because once we understand risk, we can have prices, we can have returns, we can have the volatility of returns, we can have the correlation of infrastructure investment with other asset classes, and finally, we can know or try to know how much we should invest in infrastructure to begin with. Uh, the trick is that for the past 15 years, investors have been piling AUMs into this sector without knowing any of this. Just the story and an absolute return benchmark. 
don't get me started on those. So instead, I will start with my first question, um, which I'm going to read out just to be super clear. Um, so looking back at the past decade of practice, uh, with little to no data to act upon, what motivated the choice of benchmarks and the level of allocations that have been made? And are investors maybe now wary of missing out on diversification or not picking up the right investment manager? So I'm going to start by asking Michael uh, for his thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, USS is a big UK asset owner. We are the biggest um, private pension fund by assets under management in the UK, and we invest into a wide range of assets across public and private. So for us, it's really getting the two public and private asset classes together and considering them together. Um, for private markets, I think we started investing in private markets roughly 14, 15 years ago. Um, luckily, most of it after 2008. And, um, yeah, in terms of data that we use, I think we have three use cases, and I think that will be also reflected by my, my fan, fellow panelists here. First of all, for strategic asset allocation, we need data. Um, second, for risk measurement and risk management, we need to have data. And third, for performance monitoring and performance attribution and benchmarking, we need to have data. So these are the big three use cases. Um, for an asset owner, the strategic allocation, asset allocation, um, it's, it's always difficult because you have shown this morning the exorbitant sharp ratios that you can get if you apply the wrong data set, sharp ratios of 2.73 for unlisted infrastructure. You have the fallacy of low volatility because of um, quarterly valuation, smoothing, et cetera. So that's always difficult. And um, I think one pragmatic approach is just to give a money amount as a budget to invest in unlisted infrastructure for strategic asset allocation. Then for risk measurement, risk management, you have various levels where you look at data. You can look at data at the asset level. Then you go up to the portfolio level. And then in the end, for a pension fund, you have to aggregate the data across public and private markets. And that's where the difficulty arises, because public market, you get daily data. Private markets, you get quarterly data, smooth data with all kinds of biases. And then for performance, monitoring, benchmarking, it's always difficult. You have the various requirements for good benchmarking that exist in literature. And um, if you go on the public benchmarks, you always have lag effects because public markets move faster than valuations on private markets. So there's always difficulties in terms of um, getting synchronicity. And since you also asked me a question about what is our motivation to invest in unlisted infrastructure, um, as you mentioned this morning, we like investments where we have pricing power so that we might get some inflation linkage. And then we always hope that we get uh, investments where we have stable cash flows in the end. And for us, unlisted infrastructure is one of the prime candidates to hedge our liabilities. So you have the story. Yes. But you don't have the data. We don't have the data. And that's been or we have some data, but it's not really satisfying. Okay. Um, Gianluca, what's your view on that? I very much agree with what has been said. I will summarize it this way, if I may. Uh, it's exactly true what you're saying. We have started uh, over a decade ago with a nice story and some absolute return targets. And we have had one big advantage, a very strong reduction in interest rates that has made sort of like return look very good and the picture look uh, very strong for infrastructure. Over this period of time, we have had a little bit of evolution of data. I mean, EDEC has been here already for a number of years, luckily, and we have been using it. So I think we have started having a much better understanding around three key items. On one side, using this data for risk management. Mm -hmm and having a governance around it. 
on the other side on strategic asset allocation and having some sort of sense of where the asset class may be going and has been going. And then a support for investment management decisions, which is also very important, particularly when it comes to interest risk on valuations at exit for assets, for example. We are now moving, I think, into a more advanced stage, which is really driven by two key questions that the industry needs to answer. On one side, how do we use the data that we have and the data that we will have to do better portfolio allocation, which remains a key question. How do we allocate to the asset class in the context of a wider portfolio? And I'm talking about a multi-asset portfolio because clients are becoming increasingly skilled, increasingly sophisticated. And as their portfolio grows, they want to make targeted investments to optimize the portfolio. On the other hand, uh, you talked about light at the beginning, and I would say it this way. The picture of infrastructure we have today from the data is a little bit like the light we get from a star, is an old image of that. The asset class is changing rapidly. Um, we have just seen last week, I think, the first project finance in the electric vehicle charging points being closed by a Spanish a bank. What are the risk return characteristics of the sector and how will it fit in? So as the asset class changes, this work needs to continue to be improved. More data need to be used to make sure that we follow the development of the asset class and we can construct portfolios that are resilient and deliver on what they need to. Okay, so well, that's that's why we have the TIX committee, and we continuously re reassess, refine the definition. Um, but I, so my understanding is that you have you had the story, and now you've moved on, right? You've you've managed now to integrate some of data. I know, I think I think I know somewhere where that data is coming from, but um, and and also some of these questions. But you have more questions. Okay, so it was, we're still not there yet in terms of integrating infrastructure in the, the full, the multi-asset picture. Um, Avi, what would you say? Yeah, well, first, I, I think we're going to agree on a lot of things, at least on uh, this question, but um, I, I think I, I can be additive. Um, there's uh, a, maybe a good uh, prelude here, there's a CIO of a large institution that I'm a good friend with who has said that he finds private infrastructure to be a compelling asset class because he believes that it can get you the benefits that we all talk about. But on the other hand, he doesn't have a good feel for what it is. Um, right? What does a diversified infrastructure portfolio look like? How do private and public infrastructure correlate with each other? Um, and those are really fundamental questions as uh, I think about it, I could say as we think about it in, in, in quant research. Um, if we think about private equity or private real estate, for example, um, we have a pretty good feel for how the private and public asset classes correlate with each other. And that lets us do a lot of the important things that we're talking about. We can look at portfolio construction. What's the role of private equity in a portfolio? We can get to manager selection because we can get a better feel for what the alpha is that a manager produces and how does the manager produce alpha. If you don't have a good feel for what the asset class is or for how different sectors or how different business risks correspond to each other, then you can't do a lot of that basic work. This is going to be a big, a big plug for EdHex. So I think you'll be happy, for, for Frederick. <laughs> this is one of the big advantages of having an organization like this. I think in private markets, many of us in, in private markets like the idea of it being private because Having an information advantage is something that's, that's very useful to you as a private markets investor. Um, arguably the most useful thing, or certainly one of the most useful things that you have. But you do want the market to be transparent enough that people in general know what it is that they're investing in, know how to tell if the performance that you're delivering is good performance or not. Um, so I think I have the, the same questions as Michael and G Gianluca. I do feel like the data that um, EdHEC has given us has been very helpful. And we apply that in the work that we do. It gives us a good um, initial view, at least, of how different sectors, how different business risks um, correlate with each other. Um, and we've had some really interesting findings as, as a result of that. Um, but these are questions that everyone has, and I think we'd all agree in private infrastructure, there's a lot more room to grow. So maybe I'll just close and say, 
So we are investing in private infrastructure, and a lot of people are, but it's still a bit more opaque than we would like. OK, thank you. So there's some improvement, but there's still a lot of work to do. I think uh, I would agree with that. And in fact, maybe all the way at the end, I can give you a quick idea of uh, the plans we have or the, the things we're going to do in the, in the near future uh, that might fill some of these gaps. Um, but so let's, let's move on a little bit. So now we've talked about where we're at until now, the role of data and infrastructure investment until now. Now I'd like to uh, discuss what uh, better data might do, first at the strategic level, and so for CIOs or, or CROs. Because that is the first order question, as you well know, because it's a, a, a very uh, famous result. Uh, strategic asset allocation decisions drive most of the outcome of uh, the investment management process. But even before that, the benchmark selection does, because you build your asset allocation based on these benchmarks, right? And of course, when you have an absolute return benchmark, you, you, you're walking around with a blindfold because you know nothing about the risk or the correlations of uh, that kind of, uh, of the assets that you're investing in. So I still don't understand how you, you were saying, you just pick a dollar value. I don't understand how you come up with an allocation, you just make it up. Or, um, so let's, uh, let, let's, let's see what, what you have to say. Lance, um, what data do you think investors will need or do need to uh, make better informed decisions? Um, to some extent, that data depends on who they are and what their outcome is. Um, so I think the first point you said is portfolio construction. So I think whether you look at how infrastructure is fitting in the portfolio, or for us, we're a direct investor in infrastructure, and we build inf infrastructure portfolio. So it's the granularity be below. If you invest in, say, uh, a wind asset in the UK and a solar asset in Spain, what's your diversification benefit? And once you have the correlation between all these asset classes, how do you build a resilient portfolio that actually delivers the expected return? Um, is quite is quite interesting. And, and the, port the risk drivers in, in infrastructure, if you look within the asset classes, can be very different. I mean, if you look at a broadband or a renewable asset, what we found, for example, is there is more similarity between a, a, a UK solar with feed-in tariff and long-income assets, which are real estate assets, which are both linked to inflation, than between, say, a solar or wind merchant in the UK and the solar with feed-in tariff. So really understanding the drivers, understanding the correlation, both of infrastructure with other asset classes, but also within infrastructure to build resilient portfolios. So that, I think, is a, is a big thing. Um, and, and when I said it depends from investors, I think two type of investors, I would say. You have the gross investors who are interested in whether benchmark or absolute return, but really look at total return perspective on, on their assets. And, and they look at the sort of measure you showed, like the sharp ratios and, and the total return. A, a lot of investors in that asset class, pension funds and, and insurance company, tend to be also long-term buy and hold investors. And, and some of those are less worried maybe about valuation volatility or about even um, return volatility from year to year, then they are about predictability. Um, and, and, and for those, they really look at, um, you know, what they are interested in is, you know, if I, if I buy an investment and I have a 10 years horizon, will it deliver uh, the cash flow, uh, the cash flow I, I, I want? Because they're in a cash flow matching yeah. um, uh, sort of logic. But shouldn't they care? About, about, about valuations because the, the, the market value of their assets, even though they're going to hold to maturity and receive these cash flows, and yes, the, the predictability of the cash flows is important to them. Um, first, they should be, I guess, interested in knowing whether they entered at the right price or not because that yield will come from the market price they paid in the first place. And then there are all sorts of scenarios in which you need to know how much you have got on the books. And if you do stress testing, if you do uh, you, you do the, the entry price and having data about discount rate and risk premium is, is really key. But once you're in the asset, if you're matching liability, your assets and liabilities um, tend to move, at least in terms of the, the interest rate structure, move in parallel. So, you know, if you look at just value driven by the term structure, they are not putting so much, you know, the assets and liability move in sync and therefore um, they're less sensitive to that. 
Of course. You know, that's, that's, I think that's the point Abhishek was making this morning. Yeah. On the one hand, you have risk premia, the variance or the risk of the cash flows. And on the other hand, you have uh, duration. Uh, but yet, yeah, in the end, they, they both, uh, they live together. Um, OK, so just, just, just one quick one. You were saying you wanted to build uh, robust but very granular portfolios. Do you have a sense of the size of the portfolio that you need to achieve that? Well, I think the, the infrastructure asset class, you know, and, and any private asset, particularly in private equity, is quite, you have so much transaction cost in this asset class that, you know, the trade-off between diversifying your portfolios and, um, um, you know, the cost you incur in, in trading your portfolio is, is, is not obvious. I think it depends more on the standing, in my view, it depends more on the understanding of the sectors, which sectors bring you the, the, bigger, the biggest diversification. Um, so you say, say you can have 50 uh, merchant you know, uh, wind assets in the UK, you still won't be diversified. Uh, you have as diversified as if you have 25 of those and 25 of maybe broadband or something like that. So I think it's not just a, a number, it's understanding really how, you know, to go back to your ticks classification and, and, and looking at contracted and contracted merchant and so on, how you can diversify among sectors and among asset class. Mm. Um, even with a limited number of, of actual investment. So what you really need are the betas of all these assets, the exposure to all yes. the factors, so you can opt, opt, try and optimize at yep. least to a degree uh, where to invest. Just, just uh, I find this fascinating, so, so I just have one more question, which is that what does the deal team say about this? Because it's one thing at the research or at the strategic level to say we need a bit of this and a bit of that and the other, but then the deal team gets told, go and buy this beta, uh, you know, I do infrastructure deals. I don't buy beta. So, is there a, 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 how is that knowledge kind of trickling? It's kind of on our next topic, but trickling down to the, the execution. Uh, for, I wish that uh, research was uh, had as much powers in, in in companies that we were running the deal team. I, I don't think it's quite like that. I think, but the input as strategic as asset allocation and portfolio construction starts to look by the opportunity of the market, obviously, and not, not from a blank sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, you know, twickling the allocation to make sure that over time you get to a better benefit, but other people may have other views. I mean, I, I could say I, I have the, um, the, I have a similar view to you. We, we had looked um, uh, several months ago um, to the idea that not all infrastructure is the same and you need diversification by sector. We had looked at um, the performance of several sectors. We just wanted to illustrate. We looked at transportation infrastructure against communications infrastructure. And we had found that in the months leading up to COVID in February, March 2020, the two had performed very similarly for like the year before that. Um, then COVID hit, transportation infrastructure took a big hit, right? And communications infrastructure did surprisingly well, which makes sense, right? Because people aren't flying, but people are, are, are communicating with each other. We then saw late last year, it looked like, I think we saw this in your data, it looked like transportation infrastructure was coming back. And we dug a little deeper and it looked like that that was logistics companies mainly, which also makes sense. Um, and, and this is one example, but the takeaway is clearly Infrastructure is not one thing. The idea, to your point, Laurence, that you can build a portfolio of UK wind farms and say that you have a diversified portfolio is, is, is demonstrably not, not true. Um, I, I, I do wonder, though, maybe a, a question or an observation. Individual assets, it seems like, even if you're diversified by sector, individual assets do have a lot of idiosyncratic risk yeah. themselves. And that, I think, is one of, the, one of the very compelling things about private infrastructure is the evidence seems to be that it really can deliver the things that, that you want. Um, the challenges of it are that infrastructure is not all one thing, but even individual assets have a lot of idiosyncratic risk. So the, the holy grail, you could say, even before you talk about getting, say, asset-specific alpha or manager-specific alpha, is getting that, that beta or those betas with enough diversification on multiple levels. Mm. 
So, okay, so as infrastructure becomes a larger asset class, okay, uh, and, and, and allocations increase, the question of its place and its role in the portfolio is only going to increase. So, Amarik, I'm, I'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal ball um, and tell me how do you think investors will approach this in five years' time? This question of asset allocation and, and, and in using infrastructure in the total portfolio. So, I think it's important to remember that infrastructure is actually a surprisingly versatile asset class in terms of the role that it can play within a portfolio. The vast majority of institutional investors to date have looked at infrastructure as being a genuine diversifier within their portfolios, uh, but still providing an element of growth over the long term. So the characteristics are all very familiar with um, stability and consistency of return, uh, low volatility in absolute terms, genuine diversification from public equity and fixed income markets. Um, and then to varying degrees, depending on the investor, uh, a degree of inflation linkage and a degree of cash yield. But actually, um, infrastructure is broader than that. So at the one end of the spectrum, you can use uh, senior secured investment grade uh, infrastructure debt as part of a, a cash flow driven strategy or a liability matching strategy. At the other end of the spectrum, where we're seeing a lot of growth and development in the sector, is you know, what I would loosely define as asset backed private equity as we expand into new subsectors and uh, uh, perhaps even new technologies as well. So you can either incorporate infrastructure in your uh, fixed income or liability matching portfolio or in your private equity-like allocation and almost everything in between. Uh, so to provide some context to where investors may go in the future, I thought it'd be worth just briefly mentioning where investors are at the moment. So um, we carry out um, uh, an asset allocation survey every year uh, across clients in Europe. And the last one was, um, it was carried out across over 900 investors, all institutional, uh, across 12 countries in Europe, uh, representing about uh, 1.1 trillion euros uh, of assets. And what we found there was that... Um, Interestingly, the average allocation to infrastructure hasn't really increased that much over time amongst that group, although the dispersion is quite wide, as we know, with, with averages. Um, but interesting, the number of clients or the percentage of clients that have an exposure has increased quite significantly to now uh, approximately 10% of the, the survey sample, uh, which shows that the asset class is gaining in popularity. Now, to think about where the asset class may go in the future, um, there are a couple of things that came to mind. The first is um, how do investors tend to think about uh, investing using heuristics or rules of thumb? And um, a couple of things that we see, particularly in the institutional pension scheme space, is what are other pension schemes doing? Uh, and also, um, what have we done in other asset classes that we can perhaps read across into a newer asset class? And um, I use this as a, a rough proxy, apologies for Eric, but um, real estate. Um, <laughs> in the survey, 34% uh, of, of those surveyed had an allocation to core real estate with, a, with an 8% average allocation. Now, infrastructure is a very different asset class, a much better asset class than, than real estate. Um, but that perhaps give us, gives us an indication and a guide as to where allocations may go in the future. Um, another thing that I would uh, like to mention because we're seeing it increasingly in discussions with clients is the whole topic of ESG and sustainability. And I know that that's a separate thing that we'll come to later, but I think that this will be a further, a further boost, a further stimulus to infrastructure as an asset class. So the key driver will be uh, better understanding, better knowledge of the asset class on a standalone basis, more comfort with it as it becomes a bit more mainstream. But other drivers like these secular themes and tailwinds such as uh, climate change, also uh, digitization uh, and demographics, I think will also provide uh, a strong tailwind for the asset class, particularly in the case of ESG and sustainability where there are push and pull factors. You're increasingly seeing, seeing stakeholders, both from a top-down perspective, so corporate sponsors of, of pension schemes, for example, and pension scheme members themselves asking how their capital is being invested, um, right through to uh, regulation and legislation, which is driving allocations 
in this area. And infrastructure has a lot of alignment with the topic of ESG and sustainability. So I think that will be a further stimulus, be a further push for allocations to, to increase. Thank you. Um, can, let me try and come up with an interpretation of your first point, because it could be wrong. But you're saying that um, allocations amongst those who already invest in infrastructure haven't necessarily increased, but that the number of investors who made these first allocations had increased. Right? Is that fair? So I think what's probably going on is the averages are disguising um, uh, what's probably going on under the bonnet, okay. in the sense that um, so what we're seeing is across the typical or the mainstream or the average investor, infrastructure is still probably a new or a newer asset class. So their allocations are still probably relatively modest. But those that have already allocated previously, what we find is by and large they've had a successful experience. So they're actually increasing their allocations. But because the average is across both groups, it probably looks like it's remaining static, but it's masking that, that change over time. What we're seeing um, is that, as I said, investors that do finally get comfort with the asset class genuinely, generally have a positive experience, and they want to seek to continue and grow that allocation for a variety of reasons, be they investment related, so to generate that growth, uh, that equity-like growth, but with lower volatility and lower correlation, or due to these other factors such as ESG, sustainability, et cetera. Um, so as I say, I think those averages are probably masking what's going on uh, underneath the bonnet. But the asset class more generally is increasing in popularity as referenced by the 10% now that have some kind of allocation compared to the perhaps 3 to 5% of pension schemes that had an allocation amongst that group maybe only five years ago. But this good experience, what is it based on when you say correlations, diversification, uh, do, do, they, do they really know what's, what the experience has been? Or is it I, just a I think so, that, that is a very valid point. And I think it is, when I say good experience, it is because to date, the asset class has generally delivered on expectations or exceeded expectations. But if, if one is playing devil's advocate, you could say that about pretty much every asset class post-financial crisis, because it's been a pretty benign environment uh, all round. So Benign. are investors fully aware of um, at that very granular level in terms of the, the risk exposure that they're potentially taking on to achieve those results? I would say uh, in general no. Um, and that is something that I am concerned about, particularly as the asset class continues to grow and expand in its definition. But also as more traditional assets within infrastructure change their risk profile over time. So if we think about the traditional energy sector, if you look at historic data, that will give you one interpretation of that subsector. But on a go forward basis or a look forward basis, that risk profile is likely to be very, very different. We could say the same for renewable energy mm -hmm. as we've moved from a, peri um, a period of uh, of subsidy and support to one of being uh, more merchant or shorter term contracted in nature. What does that mean from a risk return perspective? perspective? So I think one of the things that investors need to get better at is understanding the risk side of the coin and not just the return side of the coin on a go forward basis. I think so far so good, but um, perhaps being a, a, a more of a glass half empty person, a glass half full person, that is something that I believe that investors need to be more acutely aware of in future. And so using a systematic approach by factors or by, by buckets or by, by ticks, in fact, for, for example, for the question of switching uh, from contractor to merchant in, in some sectors, you can actually re, reassess, recalibrate your risk model on a forward-looking basis without having to consider that, yes, the past will be the same in the future. And of course, there's what Abhishek showed this morning, which is that um, a, a large period of if, what effectively is excess demand and also low interest rate has generated this splendid returns, but mm -hmm. this cannot go on forever um, at all. I had another thought while listening to you, which is you were saying that the other way that investors assess their position is by looking at what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so that's very true. This is something that we've, uh, we've often heard. Um, and so we're going to be producing peer group benchmarks mm -hmm. earlier next year. Um, aggregating, using ticks, aggregating what are the exposures of, say, U.S. pension funds mm -hmm. or continental European life insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera, um, and to, to, these, to these various risk factors and then rebuilding uh, the, uh, the, the, the benchmarks that correspond to each group, mm -hmm. each peer group, which should be something that uh, then individual peer groups can compare themselves to. Um, all right, um, let me move on to our next, our next question, um, which we're getting a little bit more into the weeds here, um, which is the pricing. We've talked about this a little bit already, but uh, eventually, once you have sorted out your research and your, your, your strategic uh, considerations, you need to go and invest. Um, and here, you still need to get it right. Uh, you still need to enter at the right price or the good price, and you need to know uh, that because otherwise you don't know what your true yield is. And in the end, since everyone is investing to be exposed to future cash flows, uh, th 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 this question of, oh, I don't care about market prices because I'm interested in the cash flows, it's a bit of a fallacy because this yield depends on the market price, right? <laughs> so uh, knowing the market price is still something that should interest people. So uh, my question is the following. Um, when investing in individual assets, many asset-specific considerations come into play. Uh, and that's, that's the point about idiosyncratic risk. But yet, this transaction is taking place in a market where risk is priced systematically. And we can show that. In fact, Abhishek showed you that today. Um, so how do investment teams approach asset pricing in, in this context? Or do they? Or Jainoka? So I would say the following, and I think it's a really good follow-up question to what we have discussed today. What we are looking at today is an asset class that is ex has exploded in the opportunities that you can find uh, by strategy, by sector. And it looks like that uh, risk-return spectrum of achievable strategies and assets is really, really broadening. For sure, as the risk return spectrum broadens, volatility will increase. I think nobody doubts it. On one side, when we look at portfolio, we have assets that we could define defensive, core assets, yield-based, that are, to some extent, they're lending themselves to systematic approach of pricing. And there, we can go as far today, for example, by using a deck data, you see that, on understanding how much changes in the macroeconomic environment, for example, changes in interest rates, may affect your exit valuation when you eventually need to sell that asset. So that's very important because there, I think, we have done a lot of work. We can be very systemic. We can find a way to link the top-down market view and the strategic view with the fundamentals of individual assets. We can go also far, more far away, we can be tactical. So for example, we were talking about transportation assets. If you were, look, if you were looking at the transportation market this year, you would have seen it in some sectors, such as passenger transportation, for example. Indeed, given where demand went, theoretically also valuations went down quite significantly, which really means that in theory, had, would you have had the opportunity to find an asset at the time, uh, you could have bought it because maybe it was a good tactical moment to acquire it and see the rebound. So we can be extremely systemic there, I think, more and more systemic. The question, however, the risk is when we look at the opposite end of the spectrum, what Amrik was mentioning, the proxy of private equity assets. And don't understand me wrong, I think investors understand when there is potentially more volatility, but I think fundamentally the issue is there are some new assets new sectors that are essential for energy transitions, where governments are placing strong emphasis on private investors to make sure they plug that gap. Fiber projects, greenfield fiber projects, for example. How do I evaluate them? What is the history of these projects? What will be the ability, sort of like the penetration rate of fiber in rural areas? Not many know the answers to these questions, which means that you can be systemic to some extent, but you need to be also very, very specific and start working with estimates, with Monte Carlo simulations, with sensitivity analysis to try and understand how certain factors may impact those valuations and those prices. Not only at exit, also at entry. For example, 
although every asset is different, I think clearly we can all see, and you just need to look at the numbers that are available, the larger assets that are a little bit more mature tend to go for higher prices. So you can extrapolate that information and to some extent say, okay, if I buy an asset which is slightly smaller and grow it over time, on average, I should be able to lift the multiple up by that much. I can round it up. Every 600 uh, million in enterprise value, normally, the market pays one time enterprise value a bit a multiple more. That's a linear relationship that you can measure in the market. So I, I think increasingly, we'll have uh, the market polarizing. Uh, finally, very important, diversification you mentioned, especially at this end, of the sort of like more, let's say, core plus private equity-like infrastructure where yield is a component, but increasingly assets are relying on business plan assumptions that, uh, you know, in some cases are optimistic, in some cases aggressive, but let's say uh, incorporate earnings growth. Increasingly, their diversification will be very, very important because we know that some assets will do well and some assets will do less well, potentially. Uh, and also their sensitivity analysis is very, very, very important because I think if we understand the broader systemic relationship with interest rates, with credit spreads on valuations, we can, for example, and that's what we do, guide asset management teams, support asset management teams in saying, you know, on average, you need to grow your earnings by so much to make sure that you have set the potential movement and discount rates. Investors, just to conclude, understand that, but even more, they look for that. So the paradox today is that some investors, as Amrik said, look at the growth element of infrastructure exactly for that, an opportunity to generate growth supported by strong megatrends to offset that potential increase in interest rates. This is why, potentially, the paradox is we've seen growth assets recently mm -hmm. going away at very high valuations because that, that growth has become more valuable than it was in the past. Uh -huh. So, that, and that's your approach. Huh? So it's, it is actually very systematic. And I was going to tell you, if you can figure out whatever the business case is for this fiber optic project, then you have a good sense of the future cash flows. As long as you also know its exposure to those priced risk factors, you also know the, the, the cost of risk, right? Because you, want, you, have, you have the prices of the factors. You just need to tell me how exposed you are to these, how, you, how much you're going to leverage this asset, how, much, how large it's going to be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's really interesting. So it's good to see that there, it's not just um, 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 kind of hearsay about, oh, at the moment the price is like this, like that, but actually you, you, you go very deep into uh, understanding what's, what's going to drive the valuation tomorrow before deciding to invest. Absolutely. We're trying to get all signals. You know, we have peer comparisons. We know more or less what the recent transactions in the space have been. But we have also this systematic approach that comes from the top-down perspective and tries to some extent to find a way to, uh, if anything, um, add a question mark around those valuations and manage them from a risk management perspective and say, okay, what if? Let's raise the questions. Then maybe we have a good answer for those, but let's raise them, let's bring them on the table. And that's, I think, is very, very important. How common would you say that is in the industry today, what you do? Very rare in general. Uh, but I think the industry is getting there. Yeah. Um, I think increasingly there is an understanding that uh, finding a balance between a bottom-up and top-down view when looking at the industry is important. And luckily we have data that are expanding, and as data expands we see more investors, not only on the asset management side, but also direct investors, starting to look more for these sort of like top-down functions that provide a, a support. But it takes a long time and can be a very hard process to effectively prove your value within teams that are uh, heavily opportunity driven sometimes, if mm. you wish. Okay, perfect segue to my next question, which is that entering or exiting at the probably the right, well, hopefully the right price, uh, maybe the best price remains the goal of any investor, right? You buy low and you sell high, um, even when it comes to liquid assets that are meant to be held to maturity, um, because you may never know if you might, need, might not need to sell them. So how much of an asset manager's skills um, and our performance depends on that, on getting this right? Avi. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. And so, so one thing I'll, I'll say, building on, uh, on what Gianluca was just saying, um, when we look at assets, uh, I think there's an extra layer, you could say, to the process in infrastructure 
um, beyond, say, private equity, which is trying to figure out what the asset is. And this is kind of, right, building on what you were saying, um, and also what uh, Amrik um, was saying earlier about there being different risk profiles within private infrastructure. Um, so we have a pretty good idea, for example, if we're buying a German industrials business about the place that that fits within the portfolio. And then we can try to evaluate the quality of the manager if we're investing with the manager or the quality of the asset. But we have a good idea of what we're, we're getting. Um, if we're making a private infrastructure investment, um, one question, um, Frederick, you were talking before about um, segmenting between core, core plus and opportunistic infrastructure. Um, one question that we might have is, does a manager call themselves core just because they've had poor performance in the past relative to some of their competitors, so therefore their, their return targets are lower, which is something that I think you might be able to do in private infrastructure easier than you can in private equity because there are those, right, those, those, those different risk return profiles that exist. So one part of the process is trying to figure out really what is the risk of the asset that I'm investing in. Now, now, with that, more directly to your main question, that, that skill of buying right, um, that is in, in private markets, there are, you know, we say if you're buying assets, there are, there are three ways that you can make money. One is by buying smart. Um, one is by doing things to the asset while you own it to add the value. And then the third one is exiting it smart. Um, there is, I know within the private equity world, um, there is some evidence out there that there are managers, especially industry specialists, who are able to do that to some degree. Um, it clearly is a tool that's at people's disposal. Um, how good or bad people are at that, I think that's one of the challenges. I'd say as a secondaries manager, as a fund of funds manager, that's one of the, the core areas where we need to be good is at identifying that. But it's an interesting empirical question, right? How much of value creation takes place at that stage and how widely shared is that skill? Mm -hmm. So if, there's, if you can time the market, it means that there is a market, right? And that market prices keep changing for assets over time. So I'm trying to get to the, back to the point I actually made this morning that keeping those things at this, basically at the book value or at the entry value on an ongoing basis is not necessarily the smartest oh, no. I mean, tool and from a risk management standpoint. Well, and we know this is uh, across asset classes. I mean, we, uh, across private asset classes, we know that the reported net asset values are not representative of the actual trading values, which is one of the great things about the work that, that, that you do. Um, that also means that as a buyer, one of the skills is knowing you know, what the actual trading value, what the actual arm's length trading value of an asset is relative to the value that's being reported. Um, and that's, as a secondaries buyer, that's a skill that's very important. Because if you are systematically buying at a time when NAVs overestimate the actual value, right, that's a way to systematically underperform your benchmark. So that's something that's, that's very important. Um, and then timing the market is something different. There's um, it was a dissertation done in 2015 um, that found that industry specialists might be able to tell within their sectors when public markets are near a peak or near a trough. Um, but I don't know how well that's shared. But that's a, I think in a way that's a separate question from being able to look at private markets and say, where are private market reported values relative to actual fair market trading values? Anybody else? I would agree with that. I mean, timing the market would not only apply to private asset classes, but also to public asset classes. And it's difficult, per se. Yeah. Oh. And when you buy, I mean, coming back to the esoteric asset class, I mean, if, say, I'm buying a wind farm, um, what's going to make difference between the, the, the negotiation between the seller and buyer is the power price curve. So, yeah. So depending if whether you bought or sold at a, you know, at a high or low power price curve, you could say that as a timing issue of the market or as a view of power price, it's the same thing. Um, what I'm trying to convey is not just timing the market, is 
the cash flows in many respects, more and more pr predictable, long-term, stable, contracted cash flows get rarer and rarer these days. There's more and more of a, of a say, a growth element and a risk element. And, and a lot of the discussion on the value is not just a discount rate, that's a big one, but it's just a cash flow. Maybe I'd just add a couple sure. of points. Um, I mean, I, personally, I think that, that trying to time the market um, is, is notoriously difficult in such an illiquid asset class. Um, and experience has shown that you can have variations in whole periods by plus or minus you know, one to three years in some cases, uh, either because of market conditions or because a business plan hasn't been implemented uh, as, a, as a GP wanted to. So that's very, very difficult. And I don't think that investors should be relying on that as, um, well, arguably as any real source of alpha, it should be upside, but certainly not to a, a great extent. Um, what I would say, though, is that a, a couple of things. Um, one, investors should, uh, should consider the alternative of what is a longer term hold or a buy and hold rather than a, an ability to buy and flip. So what is that alternative scenario and are we comfortable with that alternative scenario? Um, and then uh, maybe taking a different perspective, which is to say, actually, um, where are the tailwinds in the markets that can be supportive of an exit strategy over and above market timing? So um, the question is about um, market prices and holding to maturity. One of the trends that we see in the market at the moment and is just continuing is the focus on uh, traditional, classic, core, brownfield, cash generative uh, infrastructure assets in developed markets. And um, that's going to be exacerbated uh, next year by the launch of multiple new open-ended core funds in, in the market. Uh, so we're, we're likely to see a significant increase in the number of market participants and also the, the AUM available to deploy. Now, as an investor, you could look at that trend and say, well, actually, how do I get ahead of that and how do I benefit from that? So it's a, quite a simplistic philosophy, but potentially quite a powerful one, which is almost a case of we build it, but you buy it. If, if you can play into a market trend and have that tailwind, there is less reliance then on the timing aspect, um, which again can be viewed more as an upside, um, but you should still benefit from something that will uh, hopefully be in place for a number of years, if not longer, as a, as a thematic. And you can even lock in the price today. Potentially. Um, okay, so let's, let's change perspective now and go to the LPs. So um, selecting the, these, these teams that invest, what well, could be internal teams, but se let's say selecting managers to, to be, to be uh, more, more generic. How to select them and, and with, with what data. So having no data here really helps no one because um, the um, LPs don't know what's what. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute uh, with our, our paper on funds, uh, fund simulations. Uh, but also the GPs struggle to showcase what they can do, right? If there's only a few data points, how can they really prove that they're, um, they're uh, top quartile or not? Uh, it only really, the absence of data only really helps the, the sort of um, poor managers, I guess, mm. to hide amongst the good ones. In Who can one pretend to be core when yeah. taking <laughs> opportunistic risk. Um, I think you call this a pooling equilibrium in economics, mm. uh, by which it's a bit like finding a plumber in London. Um, because you can't tell the good ones from the bad ones, you're stuck with a lot of bad ones. And I don't know if you've tried to find a plumber in London recently. Um, I haven't actually, but I remember what it's like. And their uh, price is definitely core infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember, and I hear it's still the same. So, with better data, obviously, you'd be able to benchmark the plumbers and, and find find the one for you. So, one question: data limitations uh, also apply to fund performance. And so, uh, I, Michael, I know you uh, USS doesn't really invest too much in funds, but we said we would speak our minds and, and talk about our views of the market and not just necessarily what we do at, at the office. So ideally, what would an LP know about a fund or a GP uh, and, and what do, today, do they really know today? Ideally, I would like to know everything about the fund. But what, what data, what did the person the, want? The, 
I mean, the problem already starts, as, as we mentioned previously, with the information asymmetry, which definitely exists there. And then if it's a new fund, obviously you have the problem that's going to be a blind pool. So you have to rely on what's laid out in the LP documents in terms of concentration, in terms of strategies, in terms of investment restrictions. And uh, if you are a substantial investor in that fund, then maybe you can have some impact on that. But otherwise, you need to accept that. And uh, you just need to continue to due diligence the fund manager and try to extract that information, which is, in some cases, very, very difficult. Because uh, as I said, it's an information asymmetry. And it's the old lemon problem. Uh, you don't know what you get in the end with, with a new fund. And then it helps if you have already previously invested with that fund manager. Uh, you have some experience. You know the team. And maybe that gives you some comfort that they're going to, going to continue their strategy and maybe their success. And sometimes you have good, good surprises, right? You find out that you can have be no good idea surprises, why, but you the can right be guy. bad surprises. Yeah, definitely. And bad, and bad ones, of course. Um, so as these uh, portfolios become um, uh, larger, maybe. Um, again, uh, larger allocations. Um, can we imagine a more systematic or more quantitative way of selecting uh, asset managers? Um, and the one comment I would like to make here is that um, we need a better measure, whatever that measure may be, of assessing relative performance. Because um, a fundamental difference in the way, between the way in which private equity is considered, where a lot of these benchmarking techniques have been borrowed from an infrastructure, is that within an infrastructure portfolio, if your starting point is, as I mentioned, to have a genuine diversifier within a portfolio, then almost by definition, you're not going to have an infrastructure allocation that's comprised of entirely asset-backed private equity-like assets. The problem with the current approach of quartiles is that within private equity, the universe is, is much larger, so you can have sub-universes that are more appropriate to a particular strategy or a particular risk profile. The infrastructure market has grown considerably, but it's nowhere near the size of private equity. And often what you're left with is a generalist or a global peer group. Now, that put causes a, a lot of problems because do you then say that a a very high quality core infrastructure manager that has consistently delivered or exceeded on their uh, return objectives uh, over multiple funds and generated a number of successful realizations as well is a poor performer because they're not top quartile in a universe that contains managers that perhaps are focused on emerging markets or are perhaps focused on more PE-like infrastructure. If you just simply look at the, the quartile box, you would say, well, I'm not going to pick that manager. And that's a real problem in this asset class. So whether we have sub-universes that are more granular in nature, mm -hmm. or whether we have fund performance that is risk-adjusted in some way, uh, either way, we need a better metric. Now, can managers themselves come up with risk-adjusted performance? That is going to be a challenge because um, they may well be able to get there, but it's probably not something that they're considering at the moment. That's not to say that they wouldn't, but obviously these things will take time to develop. This is where there is a role for um, an independent to, uh, and arguably um, a key role, because it is independent rather than being driven by the manager, to make that assessment of what performance has been on a risk-adjusted basis and then present that to LP so they can make that informed decision. And I think like overall that would lead to better portfolio outcomes yeah. overall because it wouldn't just be a case of subjectively looking at an opportunity and saying that's great. You could actually place it into context and say, well, if I look at opportunity A versus opportunity B, what does the risk-adjusted metric tell me rather than just what the headline return metric tells me? And you need to be aware of all tricks of financial engineering to push performance up and bring you in a better quarter. That's part of the rating, yeah. Um, Avi, you, you, um, uh, you and, and your colleagues, you spend a lot of time selecting managers. How mm -hmm. do you do it? Yeah, so, uh, uh, I was, so you had mentioned um, earlier that 
the lack of data is good for no one. So I could, I could jokingly say if there is someone who has the data, then it's very good for them. I'm sure they're doing exceptionally well, which again is one of the parts of private markets. But, um, but where I think you're, you're right in saying that it's not good um, for anyone is that a, a baseline is we need to be speaking the same language. If a manager comes to you and says, I've produced, I mean, really very much like Amrik was saying, if a manager comes to you and says, I've produced a 12% return or an 8% return or a 6% return or a 16% return, you need some kind of basis to say, is that good or not relative to the risk that they've been taking? And that's, that's not very easy to find out in, in private infrastructure. Um, what, what we typically do is we evaluate managers, and here I'm talking across private asset classes, is we try to get a good feel for what the factor exposures are that they have, the risks that they're taking, their, their beta is relative to those factor exposures. And by doing that, by pulling apart their returns to figure out what portion of their returns came from broad market performance, what portion came from their sectors, what portion came from their geographies, what portion came from their leverage, we can start to get at, well, really how good or bad a manager is this, and what does that mean for their investments? Um, and to me, that's really fundamental of fundamental to good private market investing. Um, private infrastructure is, um, is far behind private equity. The work that you're doing is wonderful and driving us there, but private equity's been doing it for so much longer, right, that the data's cleaner in private equity Private real estate is something else, but I feel like in some ways private real estate, it's, it's a bit easier to do because the connections between private and public real estate are clearer. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how we go about evaluating managers. We use the same tools in private infrastructure. Um, I think, again, the big advantage of private infrastructure, the, the opacity actually creates some advantages because if you have better information than the next person does, then you can still you know, hopefully systematically outperform what you have. But we do want to have some baseline level of information so that everyone's speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. So when I, I, I listen to you and I, of course, um, like what you're saying because it's the way of, it's the scientific way of approaching mm -hmm. uh, both of what, what both of you said. How difficult is this sometimes for the, uh, an industry which has not necessarily been super scientific uh, to absorb these, these methodologies? Um, and what kind of change is needed for this to happen? So it's kind of a bigger question, like where is the industry going? Uh, sometimes we see uh, a lot of interest for that kind of stuff uh, and sometimes just, you know, I just, I just buy assets and I sell them. Um, and so what is, what is required, you think, for this uh, evolution to become, to drive the market you know, the industry? I, I could share, share one interesting anecdote. Um, I, I gave a presentation recently. Some members of our team had done some work where um, they compared public market equity levered up to the typical capital structure of private equity to private equity performance net of fees to, to primary private equity performance, to secondary private equity performance net of fees. And we find that they're almost identical other than the NAV smoothing over, over an extended period of time. Um, we have one finance PhD on our team who says, well, of course that's the case, because if that wasn't the case, then the market would drive money from one of these asset classes mm -hmm. to another one of these asset classes. Um, but when you present that to people, and this gets to your question, I find that you get three reactions. One reaction that you get from people is, wow, that's, well, okay, so one, one very rare reaction is, oh, well, that's obvious. Of course, that's got to be like our finance PhD set. That's the um, rare reaction. That's, that's the rare reaction. Yeah, um, that's the way of science. Another reaction that you get is, oh, that's very interesting. That makes me think about how I construct portfolios. But then you get two very large groups of people, one who just doesn't believe you when you say that, and another one who is offended by the idea that that could be true. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I do think that that type of method is being adopted more, but you're right, it's not how a lot of people in private markets grew up and naturally think. Yeah. I think um, sometimes the way I think about this is that 
this is going to be in part driven by the industrial evolution of the sector itself. Right? If you think about where private infrastructure investment comes from, where it emerged 20 years ago, um, why and where, uh, and where it's going today, uh, and because it's becoming much more widespread amongst most LPs, almost um, say institutional investors, there is um, a greater interest from multi-asset managers, larger multi-asset managers, uh, basically all sorts of intermediaries that are providing investment solutions and not just buying and flipping assets and providing you know, uh, more or less risky IIRs. And one version of this story is that there is, because there are many funds and many managers, that there's this degree of concentration. Because um, what I've seen, uh, very up close and personal, is that uh, first, the asset owners uh, are very interested in data because they are the ones who benefit from better data for the most part. There are some exceptions. But um, then the large multi-asset managers that have a risk culture that do sell multi-asset solutions anyway and need data because they don't only do um, multi, so they don't only do institutional uh, products, but they also do retail. So and this is kind of also the cue to our next question. Uh, increasingly, we see an interest in, in actual retail products. Um, and this requires data, this requires ticking a lot of boxes. Um, and there's this question of arbitraging between those different asset classes, yes? Which, um, so as this evolution takes place, uh, with also some regulatory pressure on top, uh, I think the, the sophistication and the, the development of, of, of uh, a more transparent, more data-driven uh, infrastructure investment sector can be imagined. It's not given, but we're betting on it. I also think, you know, the point that Gianluca made, the ever-lowering interest rate in a very long duration asset class has, has, has been favorable over the past decades. Um, things may be less favorable in, from that standpoint going forward. And I think, you know, there will probably be more buy-in to understand where is the performance coming from, really, how much value added there is yeah. from, from the manager. So I think I'm, I'm quite hopeful that the data will become more, more in demand. More and more relevant, yes. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we're here this a <laughs> lot. OK. Um, and then our final topic, the future. Um, so here. I want to imagine all sorts of crazy stuff that doesn't exist today. Um, because if you look at the history of other alternative asset classes, they have gone from obscurity and uh, well, opacity, rather, and obscurity, and being very niche and es esoteric to being very well documented, very um, well researched, and also uh, giving rise to new products. So the hedge fund sector, again, is probably the best example of something that has completely changed, um, and including, for example, over time, uh, the development of uh, hedge fund indices and then investable hedge fund indices. In fact, uh, some of my colleagues and at EDEC uh, have uh, contributed to that research quite a lot over the, the past uh, 15 years. Um, so can, what can we imagine today for, for infrastructure? Uh, what does the infrastructure investment solution of tomorrow look like in five years, in 10 years, where we have infrastructure ETFs, where we have synthetic replication, we're talking about this over lunch, et cetera. And Mike, what do you see with your crystal ball? My crystal ball. Um, so I, I guess we can interpret solution in at least one of two ways. One would be in terms of a product structure, what might an individual product or investment opportunity look like. But also a solution could be more holistic. So what does an infrastructure portfolio of the future look like? Um, so what are we seeing at the moment uh, from a product perspective? Uh, a couple of the trends that we see in the market at the moment are, um, again, the desire, as I mentioned earlier, for uh, traditional core infrastructure, um, which, is, which is only increasing. And as a result of that, um, a, a new wave of uh, infrastructure open-ended funds being launched to cater for that demand. Um, and also from GPs looking to uh, broaden their client base and also diversify their, their business models as well. Um, the infrastructure secondary market is uh, reasonably well established now. 
Um, but one of the things we have seen more recently within that market is the emergence of uh, GP-led secondaries on particular assets. Um, again, partly driven uh, by LP demand uh, for more of a buy and hold approach, uh, but also from a GP perspective, because it, it, again, it represents upside in many respects uh, in terms of maintaining and extending a, uh, a GP-LP relationship. What does the future potentially look like uh, in the asset class? Um, one of the things that um, we're hearing from institutional investors and I think will only increase over time is the perhaps irreconcilable um, differences between an increased desire for liquidity, but still access to the purity of unlisted infrastructure. And so the question is, how do you reconcile those two? Um, now, one thing that is very much crystal ball gazing is could technology play a role there? Um, and one of the potential uses of uh, blockchain, for example, uh, outside of, of Bitcoin and, and other, other coins of various different descriptions, could be to facilitate those types of transactions, but in a very secure, very efficient way. So you still have an underlying illiquid asset class, but that is made liquid through some kind of technological transaction structure. So that could be something that is new. Uh, another thing uh, that could emerge is that um, better data could lead to different types of products. So one of the things that we have seen not only in the public equity space, but also in the hedge fund space, uh, is this idea of factor identification and factor replication. That if you can decompose where a return comes from, or at least you think you can decompose where a return comes from, theoretically you can replicate that through uh, derivatives and, and whatnot, and come up with a, uh, a more liquid solution, but also a, a lower cost solution. Uh, which again, in an environment where um, there is increasing fee sensitivity and cost pressure, that may appeal to some, some types of investor as well. So they are some of the areas, I think, where we could see growth uh, and expansion. Um, another one, maybe somewhere in between of the here and now and the, you know, the, the, the distant future, uh, could be um, what is being described as um, next generation infrastructure. So trying to identify the subsectors of the future that will over time become more established and de-risked into the infrastructure asset class. So looking above the current top end of the risk return spectrum, the kind of uh, asset backed private equity um, but with a view that, if successful, those assets will be strategically repositioned into mainstream infrastructure portfolios in future. We've seen the value-add opportunistic managers in the market do that relatively successfully already. Um, what appears to be the approach now is to maybe push that one step further. It remains to be seen as to how successful otherwise that will be, but that is also something that um, I expect will happen over the coming years as well. Mm -hmm. Which fact, which, um, when you say you're talking about replication, what would you replicate? Returns or cash flows? Probably factor exposure in terms of interest rates, inflation, GDP sensitivity, and look to proxy those in some way um, to give you a synthetic infrastructure exposure. Okay. okay. Anybody else on the future? Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, in my view, infrastructure is going to play a really big role in investors, increasing role in terms of delivering to their ESG commitment and their, in particular, their, their net zero, their net zero uh, commitment. Um, I mean, Emmerich just mentioned, you know, new technologies. There's all sorts of things that are going to be required for the transition, most of which are sitting uh, in the infrastructure space, be it, you know, capture carbon capture, being hydrogen, being all, all these things, even simple batteries. Um, 
all of, of this will be, will be fundamental. But beyond that, there is the whole issue of how you improve the, the existing infrastructure, you know, the transport and, and all your existing assets, how you, how you decarbonize them. So I, I see a big role for infrastructure in, in, in terms of playing a role in, in, in investors positioning their portfolio towards net zero. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I, I, I really think, and, and, and here I'm, I'm a direct investor by background, so I really look at not synthetic ideas, but what do you actually need, need to create on the ground? And I think it's going to be a great, a great opportunity for, for investors and asset managers because typically you have a premium on new technologies. Um, so to deliver attractive premium while at the same time, you know, aligning portfolio to certain, to deliver certain impact. I also think portfolios, you know, another thing that people will, you know, I think there is a presentation later on ESG and we may talk about it more, but infrastructure is so, people think about climate for infrastructure, they don't think about the social impact of, 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 of infrastructure, but yet it is absolutely huge, both can be positive or negative. You know, if you think the UK has to double its, uh, its electricity production in the next, you know, 20 years or so, and that's going to be a huge cost. Who bears this cost? Uh, consumer, what does it mean for fuel poverty? Um, there are big, big questions there, which are both climate and social. And I think, uh, so I see a lot of strategies. I see infrastructure playing a big role on, on impact investing. Um, I, I, there will be necessarily, there will be probably product, more synthetic product developing, but there is already quite a lot to do. And from our experience as a direct investors, um, clients actually like to know what they invest in. Uh, a lot of the people we talk to and, you know, they like to know what are the assets, what do they do, what their impact. So I think I'm not yet in despair of the role of, of core infrastructure in developed market. I think there is still, still an attractive play here. Um, the other thing I'm thinking about is the huge investment made in developing market infrastructure, yeah. and I think there will be there quite a quite a big, um, you know, right now as you know, uh, Frederic, the the data is very concentrated in terms of certain jurisdiction, and the rest of the world is is pretty much not there, and I think that will completely change over the next decade. If I may add on that, I think Lorenz said something very very important. Um, one key point, if we look at all the money that may come from retail and flow into infrastructure and eventually concentrate in these few core assets that there are, all I see is a wall of dry powder. Uh, and it would be a shame because all of that capital can be essential in supporting exactly what has been described now. Here, not only data will play a key role, but also policymakers will play a key role and regulators will play a key role to make sure that capital flows in the right direction with the right risk return proposition and with a transparent risk return proposition. It means that retail capital will know where it is flowing and what it is buying. I see this as a major risk, but also as a major opportunity. And I think not enough has been done in that sense. Uh, I think multilaterals and institutions are still thinking about how to crowd in institutional investors in emerging markets or Asia, for example. Um, yet, for example, that retail capital can be an enormous opportunity to reach SDGs. Right. Okay. So let's let's actually move on to um, the next bit because it's exactly about this. We have two little bits of research. Well, not so little, but we'll show you a tidbit of the, these, two, these two bits of research. One is on ESG, so we're going to start with that, and one is on, on fund performance. Uh, and I've asked uh, some of you uh, to read uh, up ahead uh, and to comment and to, to, to uh, provide us a bit, of feed on, with a bit of feedback. But of course, everybody's invited to, to comment. So the first one is um, just a few results, one result really, uh, about ESG and the demand for ESG data or the need for ESG data that investors might have in infrastructure. So we've, we've uh, done this survey very recently in the past couple of months. Um, it's reasonably broad, right? there's about 100 uh, respondents uh, all over the world. Uh, I think a, a very good spread of regions, mostly asset managers and a quarter, uh, roughly 20% of asset donors. Um, 
So it's, it's a re reasonably, uh, I wouldn't call it representative, uh, I would have to check, but uh, because we're still finishing this, but as the state that we're at with this, these results, it's reasonably uh, interesting to look at the results right this way. And so we want to know why investors are interested in ESG data. Uh, so Lawrence, you've read this little uh, abstract and you're going to give us your, your, uh, your views. But first, I just want to show one thing, which I thought so it would answer to one question. So we've asked these respondents to rank the five reasons why they need ESG data. Uh, so from one to five, one being the highest. And the reasons we gave them were, well, either you have to report to your regulator, so you need data, you have to report to stakeholders, uh, so you need data, you have to do some risk management, you may want data to um, identify new investment, ESG data, or some other reason. Uh, the first good news is that we identified the uh, drivers quite well because other got almost uh, always the lowest, uh, the lowest ranking, meaning that it's basically those four uh, items that are the most relevant, regulators, stakeholders, risk management, and new investments. And we found no clear pattern between asset managers and asset donors, but we found a very uh, clear geographical uh, pattern. Um, overall, risk management was the best, the most often highly rated uh, answer, which I th I'm going to come back to this on the next uh, slide because I think that's quite fascinating, in fact. Um, but otherwise, uh, and, and also in the UK, it's the, the, the top, top answer. Otherwise, in Europe, so continental Europe, uh, reporting to regulators actually tends to be more often uh, the first, uh, the first uh, choice, the first rank, whereas in the UK and in Asia it's pretty low, and in the US it's the last one. So the US investors specifically don't feel that they need to report ESG data to their regulator. That might change. I know the SEC is quite active on this, um, but at the moment they don't feel the pressure, uh, whereas the EU obviously is driving this very strongly. Um, and then reporting to stakeholders is almost the opposite. North American investors say that reporting to stakeholders is super important. EU and UK investors care somewhat. In Asia, no one cares. Um, and, um, and then the op another one is that the op opportunity to use ESG data to identify investments seemed uh, not to be much of a priority except in the US. So quite different interpretation of why you might want ESG data depending on who, you, who you're asking. And I think that what this shows is something interesting. Um, very often, the talk about ESG is about impact, right? Uh, and that's what all the marketing is around, is, is based on. What these results show is that um, beyond that focus on the impact, the, the market has a much more pragmatic understanding of, of ESG. And, understands that ESG is something that's deeply related to the bottom line. Uh, so it's material, obviously it's doubly material, but it's material. Um, and so when you say you're making an ESG impact, uh, or, or rather when you say that ESG impacts or have, have uh, some kind of relationship with asset, asset pricing or uh, financial performance, it could be one of two things, right? And you've, you had your, um, uh, asset pricing uh, reminders this morning, so you know that you can either increase the cash flows or lower the discount rate, and that's basically a, uh, the two ways that you're going to create value. And I'm going to argue that if you're increasing the cash flows, whatever you're doing, even if it has positive social impact somehow, or uh, it doesn't matter, that's not ESG, it's business, because you're pricing it. If you can increase your revenue, you're selling something that has a price, right? So, and this is perhaps a bit controversial, even among some of my colleagues, let alone uh, more generally. But I think that if it's not an externality, if it does have a price, and if you can transform it into a cash flow, then great. Uh, but this is not ESG. This is what we normally or we think about when we think about a company and how much it's worth and how risky its business is. So what the ESG is about, which are those unpriced effects, is all about the discount rate. It's all about risk which is why risk management shows up in the in this survey as so, so high, right? Um, and so here you can understand having good ESG or having a, delivering a high ESG performance as something that um, is really about um, managing, um, um, well, lowering your discount rate. Uh, and so it, this, this can create performance, but it's, that's a one-off, right? You lower the discount rate one, one shot and then you cre increase the asset value. 
Um, but eventually, you end up with assets that are de-risked and that have low return. And that's pretty, that's pretty uh, simple, right? But um, this is something I, I see in those results, which contradicts the usual story that, uh, first, that ESG is all about impact, and also that ESG increases performance, um, which is, I think, quite confused. Anyway, um, that, I, think, I thought that was a, quite, a, quite an interesting uh, uh, tidbit that was coming th for, for me through, through that data. But Laurence, do you want to have a, a, maybe a more thorough go at this? And, uh, and uh, the feel free to knock down my slightly uh, uh, radical interpretation. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's radical, Frederick. I must say, I did the survey myself, and you know, risk. You say you said this morning is like electron. Nobody, uh, nobody knows uh, can measure it, and people have different views. I mean, you're right um, in that. You know, one of the impact of of um, of good ESG is lowering the risk premium, and therefore, you know, it has it has a value which is not not necessarily cash flows. Um, but risk has also a, a real cash flow risk to it. I mean, look at what the oil sector is going through now. Look at, you know, some sectors in in in, um, in infrastructure. You know, a lot of people build, built gas-fired power plant to get coal off stream, and now gas is really bad. And and then they built AFWs to uh, get rid of, of 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 waste, and now EFWs are criticised as well. So I think there is a real risk dimension, uh, which can be translated by discount rate, but which is also probably visible in, in the cash flow to it. I thought that this survey was really interesting as well in terms of the, um, uh, you know, when you think about risk in terms of discount rate, it's also uh, an opportunity. I was quite surprised by the first question about how few people consider ESG in investment strategy or, or new investment. The, the, there was quite a contrast in terms of, of jurisdiction, in terms of how important is the regulator, and that may reflect more the how stringent and how enforced the regulation is in different regions rather than, than anything else. Um, then stakeholders, I understood, is, is important everywhere. Um, one area which was not very important is, is in, in identifying new investments. Yes, when we, you look, for example, at you know, sector allocation people, again, how much people invested in renewable, it's not only because there's a lot of renewable being built, it's also because there's a lot of money chasing that market for, for ESG reasons. So I think ESG in terms of, um, you know, a selection sector right alongside financial metrics and because, as you said, it does influence the discount rate and it does influence the return is, 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 really, is really important. Now, I know that some of your colleagues in, in Scientific Beta produced a paper saying, you know, the ESG alpha in, in public market is a, is a fallacy and, you know, what happened is actually people invested in those sectors and by selecting those sectors you would have generated your ESG alpha. But I think this is a, an interesting academic debate, but the fact that people invested in those sectors is for a mixture of, of reasons, one of which may be an ESG objective. Um, uh, yes, so the, the argument is that it's, it's not so much that it's a bad idea to do ESG, it's that it, the excess returns are not there. It's, 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 all, it's all explained by market movements, and excess demand in this case. Uh, well, but the market is, that, that, is, that is right. But I, what I'm saying is ESG is to some extent driving allocation. Um, and, and therefore driving the market. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a bit, the relationship is less black and white. It, it is not the, the impact on society that driving the return, but it's the supply and demand and, and the perception of the market which is driving the return. And, and, and therefore, whether it's, it's impact driven, it, it has an impact. Yes, um, but the thing is, well, this is, uh, perhaps the, for a different debate. Uh, but um, every business has an impact. And the first impact is the impact of their, again, the, the, their actual business, what, they, what is priced. If 
you sell food or heat or whatever it is, you have an impact. It's usually a positive impact as well. It's just yeah. that it's intermediated by market. And then you have these other impacts that are not intermediated. But the, the notion that uh, the only way to have an impact is to invest in uh, things that are having large positive externalities. And it, I mean, everything has an impact in the end. Um, and, and possibly a larger impact, is, the larger impact is the part of the, the business that is priced and is reflected in market prices. Yes, yes, that is, that is correct. But just to go back to your risk interpretation, I think you know, the way that I interpreted it as a, as a direct investor on ESG risk, and, 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 and you know, the first thing we did when we developed our first ESG policy is screen every new investment on an ESG standpoint. And this screening was initially very much focused on risk. What's the risk of, that my investment has? Because we recognize infrastructure is so, it's providing an essential service to society is, 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 is therefore quite in the line, you know, quite in the spotlight and, and has a number of ESG risks. So the first thing we did is at, at every, throughout embed the ESG, uh, ESG process throughout every investment. But I think, the, the market is now evolving towards more impact strategy and impact funds, and that you may not do it on every asset, but you do it more on, on, on specific strategies. Um, and that's where, you know, in your survey, I think you, you show the difference between looking at, at the externalities, if you want, which is the impact as opposed to the risk. And I think we, we see this dichotomy now. There is a bit of confusion, but for us at least, we look at the ESG throughout, and then we, we try to look at the externalities and impact and measure it much more closely when we build a, an impact strategy. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else want to comment on this? The, the drivers of ESG demand, uh, the data demand amongst investors. I have a more general point. I think there's also still some uncertainty about what is actually the definition of ESG. Yeah. Because uh, if you look at ESG ratings, um, there are several academic papers around, one by Dimson et al., who show actually that ESG ratings from various rating providers have a very low correlation amongst each other. So there is some divergence in the ESG ratings, and then also translating those ESG assessments that you do, where some of them, or the majority of them, are probably qualitative rather than quantitative to transform them into something quantitative that you can apply in your valuation models. So I think there's still some yes, work to right. be done there. You're right. We, we, we reviewed that for infrastructure in a mm. paper uh, last year, last year, this year, um, last year, when we reviewed all the ESG schemes for infrastructure mm -hmm. investment and showed that divergence exists as well. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's very significant. And ESG mostly is still the E and rather not the SNG, I think, in the mm. risk assessment. But here again, I, I yeah. maybe that's an, a very much a European perspective. Mm. Uh, yeah. And I guess in, in I was struck, out, this was also a comment I received during our last advisory board meeting. We had to have two sessions because one was with the US and the other one with the other side of the world. And so all the US advisory board members were in the same meeting and they were all saying, well, you know, the environment, okay, but what about social issues? So, different perspective from different parts of the world. Any? I will add just two comments. On one side, I think regulation is at the moment really driving a change, at least in the short term, at least in Europe. What we have seen is that in the context of the taxonomy now, at least in the short term, some investors, some managers are taking a little bit more, more of a prudent stance around impact, so article, let's say, nine definition and starting from Article 8, because impact is such a complex topic, there are risks of retroactive changes to regulation. So that is good, I think, because there is a little bit more of a step-by-step -step process around uh, where to go. The second point is, which is very, very important, we have talked about one side of the materiality, but Frederick, you mentioned, we're talking about an asset class which is exposed to double materiality. So yep. I think, Today, the beauty of our asset class and the beauty of owning private assets, being able to manage it, is also mitigating ESG risks directly, like physical climate risk, for example. And what we have seen there is that uh, although we may not focus on the discount rate, 
and we may spend actual money to make an asset physically more resilient to the fact that there will be stronger precipitation, more frequent precipitation, more unpredictable precipitation, may as well preserve the physical value of the asset and so somehow indirectly be reflected also in discount rates going forward. And I think we will see methodologies and data playing a very important role there because to some extent it takes the academic discussion down to sort of like a tangible uh, discussion around how really to manage physically assets and, and make them more resilient to something which is coming and becoming bigger. You'll be glad to know we have a big project working on that, collecting that data on physical risk, um, but that's uh, it's for a different day. But I think I would like to, you know, react to Michael's point on, on you know, ESG is, and, and I was interested in your survey, it says a lot of people are still very attached to ESG scoring as, as a tool. And, and yet ESG is everything, you know, people can, you know, it can be anything from climate impact to, uh, you know, gender equality or whatever. I, I mean, it's, it's just, yeah. it's just mind boggling and it's, it, you can't see, you know, you, you can't see, I, I don't think a score really helps you making decisions. So I, what I, I think that the, the idea of really looking at different ESG factors and identifying each, each ESG factor is really a, a, a big step forward. And, and again, sharing your view, it's not going to be just climate, it's going to be a lot of the social impact. I mean, if you look at what, what impacted renewable, you know, a renewable project in Spain, it was, it was ultimately, you know, the cost of electricity was unaffordable for, for people, and that's what, what drove, the, what drove the review of tariffs. So I think issue of the affordability of infrastructure, issue of the social impact of infrastructure, it's very important to, to measure those. Oh yes. Three points if I may, Farik, just on this. Um, I was reassured by the second bullet point there um, because uh, at least in our view, ESG is about integration and not just impact. Mm. So if we, we take a very basic example, uh, impact is uh, investing in supporting a, uh, an onshore wind farm. Um, but uh, despite that fact, you know, if there is a very poor interaction with a local community uh, on the building of the wind farm, leading to a souring of relations, if the shareholders are fly in, fly out, only come to board meetings, have a nice lunch and then, and then go away, um, if uh, there is very poor health and safety on site, uh, resulting in injuries and uh, uh, employee unhappiness, then that is not good ESG. So superficially, it may be having an impact, but ESG isn't integrated into the, uh, the due diligence and the asset management process of that particular asset. Um, the other point that I would like to make is that um, what we're seeing is that the consideration of, of ESG integration is going or will go beyond the asset in isolation to the entire value chain. We were talking about this earlier. It's surprising the number of corporates across different sectors that can't fully account for their entire supply chain and what goes on at every stage of the supply chain. So one of the key areas at the moment uh, of a lot of interest is um, uh, electric vehicles and electrification more generally. but the components that go into batteries are mined. So there are issues around mining uh, and there are issues around how uh, those resources are actually mined by people, which again, I think these issues will become even more important to investors as they broaden their scope of what they consider to be part of ESG. And the final point I'd like to make is that investors are also looking beyond what is going on at underlying asset level to what is going on at GP level uh, in terms of uh, not just ESG, but um, other aspects around that as well. So increasingly what we're seeing is that uh, GPs themselves are becoming more proactive in demonstrating what they're doing um, with regards to these issues uh, because again, investor interest is widening beyond that initial you know, what is the label attached to my infrastructure investment to what is actually going on within that entire value chain uh, in which I've invested. You're going to love our um, upcoming uh, social acceptability risk index um, of infrastructure all over the world. Um, 
Yeah, I think you're right. The, and but, you know, we were talking about transparency as well. Right? Wouldn't that be part of the ESG for the asset manager to be transparent? I think the, I think the challenge, and to be fair to GPs, is that um, it's not for a, a lack of wanting to. It's it's about having that degree of standardisation. Mm -hmm. So standardisation of requests from LPs, but then standardisation and comparability across the industry as well. So use ticks. And <laughs> don't get me started. All right, um, and we have we have twenty minutes left, so we have one last one last little bit, uh, which is our most recent work on funds. So this is something that came out of many many conversations on benchmarks. A lot of investors telling us, "Well, we love what you do. It's super interesting, but uh, we invest in funds, so we're not exactly sure how to use your benchmark." And I know that. Uh, you know how to use our benchmarks, but, but not everybody kind of, you know, um, b put it this way. People wanted to see IIRs and TVPIs and stuff like that, before and after fees. So we thought, okay, well, maybe we can, we can look at this. And we were quite surprised, because in my mind, perhaps more naively, uh, this was covered, right? Uh, you had uh, people report their IIRs and their ratios and, you know, that stuff. Little did I... Uh, realize that the contributed data that exists is very, very poor, especially by vintage. Right? Of course, it's been collected for quite a while, so if you look at it as a block of uh, 10 years of, or 15 years of data, you, there's something there, and actually this is useful for us to be able to backtest against a whole block of data, what we produce now. But in any given vintage, we realized that there was uh, somewhere between 15 and 35 data points for a unique fund looking at these various databases. Um, and so then it's very basic stats. Uh, it's impossible to know, impossible to know what the quartiles are. Impossible. Um, let alone with any kind of granularity. If you wanted to know what the differences between core and core plus, or different parts of the world, etc., um, um, and I think again, and the market knows this. Uh, I was just—I was the only one who kind of wasn't aware of that. Um, and so we recently we, we presented this research in a webinar, um, and there was a little poll at the end: Do you use quartiles? And it's a bit the same story than with absolute return benchmarks, because people had nothing. They used absolute return benchmark because they're stuck with you know, not, nothing else. Um, so here, people use, uh, don't use quartiles because 60% of the people who attended that webinar we did a couple of weeks ago, so they don't use quartiles because as they understand that it's, they're not good enough. So we were hoping to fix this. So first, I just wanted to illustrate this point um, that if you do have only 10 or 20 or even 50 or even 100 data points per vintage, you know nothing. Sorry, I'm quoting from, uh, directly from 40 Towers here. But, um, the, uh, so if you have 10 data points, so this, uh, this is what this shows you, this picture shows you, is data that we drew from a normal distribution with, uh, which represents an IIR distribution uh, with, a, I think, a mean of 10% and a standard deviation of 20%. Uh, this is the good version of reality where returns are normally distributed of course, they're not, so it's even worse in, way, in reality. But let's say they're normally distributed, and I take 10 data points from that distribution at random, and I try to compute the quartiles. So this is what's going on on the left-hand side of the picture. The real quartiles, which I know, because I've made the, I've decided on, I know the mathematical uh, form of that distribution, are the three red lines, right? And uh, I get my 10 data points, and I compute quartiles. And I, obviously, I'm completely off. Not only am I completely off, but the confidence interval, the 95% confidence interval of the quartile boundary is so big um, that because I have so little, so, so few data points, uh, that I can't even tell the difference between my three quartile estimates, really. So I, I know nothing. If I have 10 data points, I know nothing. Uh, 20 data points, it's, it's a little bit better in the sense that you can start to, you start to see those, those quartile estimates and their confidence intervals sort of stack up like this. They still overlap a bit, um, but obviously we're still way off the real, the true, uh, the true uh, quartiles. 50 data points, it get, get, starts to get better. So we already know that's impossible. There are, with this very, very, very rarely 50 data points per vintage uh, in what I've seen. 
but it's still off, it's still wrong, and so you're still quite likely to mis uh, miscategorize um, a, uh, a manager if you use this to, as your, your boundaries. 100 data points, now we're getting a little bit somewhere, uh, so obviously that's not available to anybody, um, but it's the, the confidence interval is still pretty wide, right? So we're, we're still not, we can't be quite sure that we're actually estimating the quartiles properly. All this to say that it, until you have 1,000 data points, ideally 10,000, you don't know where the quartiles are. You don't. Um, neither can the manager prove where they are to their potential investors. Um, so that's a problem if you're trying to use this to either select managers or assess managers, isn't it? Um, and I guess that's why 60% of the people who attended that webinar said, well, we don't really use that. Uh, or maybe they, they, to be fair, they were asked the question after they were shown this. Maybe they don't know. <laughs> um, but, uh, but this is not something that's, uh, in fact, um, new. Um, Gianluca, last time we met in New York uh, two years ago that you, there were, you, you, were, you were being a bit rude about that kind of data. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. um, so what can we do? We, we thought we could, we could maybe we could fix this because as you know from uh, Abhishek's presentation this morning, we price hundreds of companies every month. I was gonna say every quarter, but now it's every month. Um, and so we have these market prices uh, and we have all the dividends of these companies. And so we thought, well, maybe we could simulate the behavior of funds. After all, these infrastructure funds, they are uh, at least the standard ones, the most common ones, they are quite alike. Of course, every manager is very different, et cetera, but the funds are quite alike. They pick up assets for a few years. Um, they charge this, one is the same fees. They then dispose of these assets. Uh, meanwhile, they collect cash flows, they distribute, et cetera, et cetera. You, you can make a very convincing model of what the standard fund looks like, right? You can calibrate it uh, in terms of the evolution of fund size, ability to deploy capital, uh, and all sorts of things like that uh, by looking at historical market data and also talking to the market. So we've, we, we did a lot of uh, interviews, so semi-structured interviews with fund managers and, and LPs to determine what the right assumptions were. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of uh, technical assumptions. I don't really want to get into that right now because um, the point is this stuff works quite well and we get very good results. I'm sure we can change some assumptions or we could come up with a you know, different type of fund as an alternative uh, simulation. The point is, since we have all these assets, we can imagine what the world would be like or what these results would be like if tens of thousands of these funds existed and they could buy these assets and sell these assets at the market price at each point in time and receive the cash flows that they actually did pay, uh, the dividends that they actually did pay over, the, over this history. Right? And if we can do that, it's a Monte Carlo simulation, um, if we can do that, um, we can f have as much data as we want. It's just a matter of computing power. How much is it? How much uh, time do you need to run this these days, Abhishek? Two days. Two days for 10,000 simulations per segment, right? Yeah, for 100 segments, yeah. Um, so you want, uh, as long as we have enough underlying data, of course, uh, we can simulate the existence of thousands of funds in a segment where maybe in reality there's only 10. Um, and, um, and again, that, that works. So on this picture, if you you can or you cannot see um, because it's not very uh, it's not very bright. Um, the, on the left hand side, you have the, this is all our data, all, all the simulations we run over uh, a twenty year period. Okay, we ha uh, actually it's more like a fifteen year period. Sorry, um, so it's uh, 15, 14, 000, uh, observations. So we don't exactly run one thousand um, uh, simulation per year. It depends. But anyway, we have very many data points. We've, we've have almost any outcome uh, in, this, uh, in this set of results. So you have the funds that, were, uh, that did really badly and actually failed. We have some rules about funds that fail depending on their inability to deploy capital and, and not reaching a TVPI above a certain threshold, et cetera. Uh, that have re that some that have done incredibly well. Most of them have done something that's you know, around the average of what uh, the, the results we get. And so, here again, 
uh, we get three quartile boundaries, which are those little black lines in the middle of all that gray, those gray dots. And on the right-hand side, you have 200 data points that are actually contributed data points for the same time period um, in the, in, you know, by, uh, by asset managers. And the quartiles match almost perfectly. Meaning, so 200 data points, as I showed you earlier, it's, it's not a lot, but it's okay. You start to get a sense of what the quartiles really are. So this is very backward looking. We don't want to use this now to assess an asset, uh, or, sorry, a manager in, in, in a current quartile, in a, sorry, in a current vintage. But um, in terms of backtesting the simulation, it's, not, it's, it's interesting, right? We know that the, the, the quartiles were reasonably, um, reasonably well known for those, those past 15 years. And uh, we see that the, what the simulation predicts is basically bang on or at least certainly in the confidence interval of those 200 uh, cases. So it shows that we, it, it, it can be made robust. Of course, there were multiple iterations, there were multiple tests. We also uh, market tested all the results with a number of participants. To sh we showed them all the, uh, the IIRs and the TDPIs for different segments, et cetera, depending on their specialities to make sure that people thought, um, uh, found the results convincing or at least believable. Um, the point is, you do this in aggregate, so we find the same quartiles. Okay, so great. Uh, but when you do this in one vintage, we find very different quartiles because now in one vintage, so this is, this is 2018, on the right hand side we have 20 data points or so, or 20, maybe 25. So our quartiles are completely unknowable, as you can see from the, especially the top quartile here, it could be almost anything. Whereas on the left hand side we have 10,000 simulations uh, and um, we have a pretty good idea what the quartiles are. So by using market prices uh, that are computed uh, according to the methodology, you, you, you know and it's, it's quite um, robust. And simulating funds using the standard rules, we managed to get something that looks like what the universe uh, is, historically speaking, and should be if we, we had enough data in each segment. Right? So we've kind of solved the question of the granularity and the robustness of the quartile estimates. And of course you can do this uh, gross of fees, but you can also run this with any fee scenario you want. So two and 20 with an eight person hurdle rate or one and 10 with a six person hurdle rate or any combination of the above. Um, and, uh, or in, and also use um, fee levels that are extracted from market, historical market information, which is a little bit more maybe uh, like a historical uh, representation of what the quartiles have been in the market as opposed to for one type of fund, one type of fee structure, et cetera. So the point here, here is that it's possible with data and um, a bit of market testing to generate results that solve some of these uh, data uh, holes or the, the, this, this data paucity problems that we, we, we have and which are uh, endemic so far were very difficult to, to get rid of. So now I have asked um, Avi uh, and later Gianluca to uh, provide their comments. So they've read the paper. It's a slightly longer paper than that little ESG survey, which we're still, we're still finishing. Um, but uh, we have about 10 minutes. I think we can go over by a couple of minutes. So I'd love to hear your, your comments and uh, your input. Well, I will try to be, be brief then. Um, so I, I really like this paper, and I like the work that you've done. Um, and I think there's applicability here not just to private infrastructure, but to other private asset classes too. Think about private equity, private real estate, perhaps private credit. Um, it, it reminds me when I was starting my career a long time ago, um, my first boss had said the biggest division in every investment bank and every private equity firm is the one that shows that they're number one or top quartile in everything, um, the one that creates the stats and the analytics for that. Um, and I think the way that quartiles tend to be calculated um, makes them less meaningful than they can be. Um, so a, a one, one major example of that, as you're saying, is the data scarcity. And that's not just in private infrastructure, that's in other asset classes too. If you're looking at private equity funds, for example, and you have one software fund in there and a healthcare fund in there, Right, you're, you're probably getting systematic risk. You're probably getting different factor exposure um, more than you're getting real, real manager skill in there. Um, and also, if you are, you know, if you're raising a, a fund, the, the easiest way I could think of to almost guarantee yourself or to maximize your probability of being in either the top or bottom quartile 
is to have a very concentrated small fund where you maximize the idiosyncratic risk, right? Because if you have a well-diversified fund, you're less likely to end up on one of those outperforming tails. Um, so I, I, I like this. I, I, I like the fact that you're creating something that's um, much more representative, that gets you get a better hold on what the core tiles are. Um, I think that also potentially solves a problem of different vendors um, providing sometimes very different core tiles depending on what the representativeness is in, the, in their data set. Um, I'd be very interested in seeing um, a follow-on to this be the uh, predictiveness of someone landing in one quartile versus, versus another. Um, we've seen just in work that, that we've done that IRR tends not to be very predictive fund to fund because presumably all the sources of noise in there. Um, TVPI we found does, but that's probably just because um, if you have two fund managers, one tends to, one, one tends to hold the assets longer than the other. The one with the longer hold period, all things equal, will systematically have a higher TVPI. Um, so that might not represent skill. Um, so I'd be very interested in seeing the predictiveness of these better defined quartiles. And as you use different measures, so as you add PME measures, which you've had also, um, and, and, and alphas. I, I think there's also an interesting question, which is um, in rather than looking at the asset level, which you had done previously, and going to the fund level, I think there's an interesting question of is there meaning to the fund level, right? Is, is a fund just a, in a sense, meaningless wrapper around a group of investments that doesn't have any meaning or, any in, or provide any indication of manager scale? Or does it mean something? So you could see, for example, a manager might take different risks early in a fund life than they do later in a fund life. Mm. Um, and if that's true, then I could see the, the fund level is really having meaning. Um, though I'll say one thing that I think m makes the fund level more difficult is we know that IRRs, at least, are very impacted by the timing and size of the investments. So the difference between a first and fourth quartile fund can be just was your best investment the first one and your worst investment the last one, or was your best investment the last one and your worst investment the, the first one. So I think there's a lot of interesting follow-up research here. Mm. Um, I'd also be, be interested in seeing as you develop this more, um, while you're creating the synthetic funds, um, how you model the um, investment pacing of the synthetic funds. Um, and, and, I, and I know that you've done work on that and how that changes in different economic environments. Um, hold periods, how you manage the hold periods of different funds uh, with, within there. So I'm not going to take up uh, more time, but I think, there are, I think this is really interesting. And I think there's a lot of really interesting and useful follow-up research to come from this. And again, not just for private infrastructure, but I could see this for private assets in general. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so we, we, we have all, all the assumptions in the paper, which is on our website, by the way. Um, but um, I agree with you that uh, we also want to run uh, some sensitivity analysis around yeah. some, I mean, we have, in fact, but yeah. we, we, we want to publish that as well, so sensitive analysis of the results around some of the assumptions. Yeah. yeah. Um, Gianluca. Yeah, uh, I will be very brief. Uh, this solves a practical problem, the practical problem of a researcher at 8 p.m. hoping to go home and receiving a phone call saying, your fund has just dropped from top quartile to bottom quartile. Why? And you look at it and realize that there are six data points and one has disappeared. And you try to explain that, number one, you need some criteria around the funds that you are looking at. And then they say, but why are you making excuses? <laughs> <laughs> and number two, it's very important to make sure that the timing of these uh, data are aligned. And for example, during COVID, we have had some funds that have not reported for a while results, while others had, creating a massive mismatch in this data. So how is this solving it? Is creating a statistically sound simulation around the sample, making it big enough 
to give us the opportunity to understand where, with a higher degree of probability and a lower confidence interval, certain quartiles are. And all it does, it creates increased transparency for the asset class. Um, so I think it's a very positive development which will make practical life easier and importantly increase the transparency of the asset class, increase the transparency for asset managers, uh, demonstrate their ability to outperform uh, whenever they outperform. And this is very important because track record remains, according to many surveys, one of the key criteria that uh, investors look at when they select managers. Thank you. So you don't have anything negative to say? Um, well, I need to look at the, <laughs> at the tool still. I've read the paper, but I think you know, it's an increase in level of transparency. The only risk may be, medium term, if the fund universe keep on cha keeps on changing mm -hmm. uh, and you will have more thematic uh, investment strategies. I mean, today we have strategies that only focus on batteries, for example. So mm -hmm. how do you look at them from a risk return perspective? How may returns distribute? Uh, so as the asset class is evolving, exactly what we said at the beginning, we may well have to look at the criteria that we use, the lenses that we use to interpret that reality, but that will follow uh, with, with a bit of a time lag. Yeah, all the way upstream for us, we have another team which looks at the market and says, okay, we need more of this, less of that, because the market is changing, and then this trickles down into the pricing database, which then allows you to do these simulations, uh, as long as you have enough, yes, enough underlying assets, of course. All right, this takes me to the last slides, uh, and the moment for predictions. Uh, so, we have, I have these five predictions. Um, the first one, and so I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, by a show of hands, of, uh, of, of telling me if you agree or not. You don't have to agree, of course, but let's see if you have some, we have some kind of uh, consensus in the end. In the next five to ten years, one, the need for more or better data and infrastructure investment will grow as, invest, as investors, I'm sorry, there's a typo here, regulatory and peer pressure increase to report risk and market prices. Who agrees? So yes. Unanimous, I'm not too surprised. Okay, uh, so that's the future. Two, better data will create or increase the competitive advantage of those who have access to it and can use it to invest better and report more transparently. I'll give an emphatic yes to that one. Okay, that's the future as well. Number three, data-driven unlisted infrastructure products using physical assets will be developed including investable index-based products in the next five to 10 years. Investable indices, so just like you had investable hedge fund indices before, or still today. Could I say I'd like to see it? So, so that's half a, half a yes. <laughs> Who believes this will happen in the next five to 10 years? Ooh, no consensus here. Four, statistical replication products will become possible and, complement, and a complement of investing in real infrastructure assets. Ooh. I think there will be attempts to create replication products. Whether or not they complement real infrastructure investing is another question. Fair enough. I think that the market will, the, the profit motive will drive the market to look in that direction. But whether or not they are successful in a portfolio context and they're widely adopted, uh, I think remains to be seen. And, and whether it's possible in private infrastructure specifically, I think mm -hmm. might still be a question. Of course. So you don't, you're not sure, okay. Yeah. I agree, not sure. I would like to see it. We have seen hedge fund replication, we have mm -hmm. seen private equity replication. So mm -hmm. it's natural that somebody will develop replication products for infrastructure. So we like the idea. But we like whether they will be successful, I don't math. know. Yeah, but okay. Gianluca? Let's see how fast the retail side of things develop, because if we have more data and to some extent more liquidity there, we may see this expanding into yeah. this type right. of uh, direction. So Lars, you're also not too sure. Yeah, no, I think it is probably linked to, to adoption by retail investors because they, they, they're keen to have that liquidity and so on, which, mm -hmm. which is not there in, in the traditional infra fund. So yeah, that could drive Ah, so I have a, more of a yes here. I'm not sure it will be successfully developed. I'm, 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 and, okay. But I think one of the steps to get there may be the appeal to retail investors. Okay, so we, we basically agree very strongly on the first two points. We know that's the future. The other two, that remains something. 
to demonstrate and to realize. And my final and perhaps favorite one of Jen and of what abandoned the CAPM and adopt a more robust statistical technique to assess the cost of capital of regulated utilities. Who thinks this will happen? If rates go up, I think utilities may ask for that. <laughs> the utilities will ask for that, but will, will the regulators let go of CAPM? Depends on your power of persuasion, I guess. <laughs> uh, as, as we like to say, you know, the one thing we know for sure in empirical finance is that CAPM does not work. But anyway, um, but but despite that fact, it is commonly and universally used. So, I think go figure. I think the the alternative would need to be very comprehensive and very robust for any industry participant, be it a regulator, be it individual investors, be it an association, to move away from a de facto standard, even though there's a common understanding of the weaknesses of that standard. Even when they've delisted every single list of proxy? Maybe that's the way forward. Continue delisting those. <laughs> anyway, um, OK, so you're not convinced. All right. This is that's a zero vote. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's the future. The first two things on this list will happen. The next two, maybe the last one, probably not. And this concludes our Eric Infra Live uh, research debate. And on this, and with five minutes behind uh, the time, I uh, thank you, and I'll see you. I will tell you. Uh, see you next time. Bye bye.